10, 12 years ago, I had a program in uh, Honolulu, and I'd never been there before. And it was kind of exciting, right? They're having me present in Honolulu. I thought, great, we left our kids home. <laughs> My wife came along with me, and we flew overnight into Honolulu, and it was great. Friday morning, picked up by a female cab driver, not so surprising. Beside her was a seven or eight-year-old daughter, and I assumed she was taking her to school. You know, it's 8.30 or 9 in the morning. And my wife and I are in the back, and it became quite obvious to us that we were out of our element as parents, having, you know, a one and four-year-old at the time, when that seven or eight-year-old said, Mommy, where are all the idiots today? <laughs> we're like, whoa, is this what seven or eight-year-olds say? But without skipping a beat, her mom replies, relax, dear. They only come out when your dad is driving. <laughs> How we see the world. Is that person cutting us off? Are they an idiot? Or are they going to the hospital for an emergency? But in that pressure moment, we can jump to conclusion, which we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. We do that based on less than 5% of available information. And all of a sudden, that drives so much of our behavior. There's this myth of pressure. This is maybe the first and most important part of chapter one in the book, which is that most people think that some people rise to the occasion. Some people do better under pressure. Would you agree? Yeah, there are people who do better under pressure. I hate to break it to you, but it's a myth. It's wrong. It's not true. Pressure diminishes our thinking ability, our ability to manage emotions, our ability to retrieve memory. And if you look at in you know, chapter one, there's a whole section on how it uh, diminishes creativity, teamwork, and on and on. In sport, we know no NBA player shoots a better free throw when they're under pressure at the end of the game than their season average. Same with clutch hitting in baseball, and I could go on and on. Now, this may seem like a negative message. It's not. What it's meant to say is the data tells us that nobody does better under pressure. So what's the aha about that? Well, what that should mean to you is that you have to manage it differently. You gotta try and minimize pressure's effect on you. That's very different. All of us are in these bubbles of thinking every day. How many thoughts do you think each one of us have in our bubbles of thinking a day? How many thoughts a day do you think we have? According to the best research we know right now, we have about 60,000 thoughts a day. According to a female colleague of mine, men only have one thought a day. <laughs> 60,000 times a day. But I'm sure it was the same with your exceptional leader. What was it about them? that really made that difference, that had that influence on you? Well, the truth is, it's not how smart they were, not how technically astute they were. Now, let's be clear, you need a certain amount, right? There's a bar that you need to cross. You need a certain amount, we call it a threshold capability of IQ, let's say. But once you cross that threshold, any more IQ doesn't give you a big advantage. Does that make sense? It's the difference between what we call an entrance criteria and an excellence criteria. IQ is an entrance. Once you get your foot in the door, you get the job, IQ ceases to become a predictor of who will be a high performer. Let me give you an example. Uh, you know, somebody who says it better than I. Warren Buffett said, if you've got a, an IQ of 150, take 30, sell it, get some value for it. <laughs> As only Warren Buffett can, right? Let's unlock potential here. Like, you have enough, you're in the room. And by the way, at age 16, your IQ is fairly concrete. You won't increase it very much. My daughter just turned 17. I had to break it to her. Bridget, hate to say it, but you're not going to increase your IQ now. Even if you're not a basketball fan, you'll see that the story does transfer. So that team, who's on that team? Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis the Circus Rodman, right? Coached by who? Phil Jackson, not a bad basketball coach, right? That team, if you ask basketball historians today, they will tell you it was not the most talented team of their generation. It wasn't. They lacked a big man, you know, a really strong center. Here's what they did especially well. The game would be over, the team would come in the dressing room, the door would close, the media's on the outside. And in that dressing room, let me ask you a question. What do you think? Who was the first person to admit, to freely admit making a mistake in the game? Michael Jordan's a great answer and he was pretty good at it, but there's one person who led the way. Coach, absolutely. Phil Jackson would step in there and he wouldn't go, Rodman, what were you doing? Or Pippen, what do you, he'd go in there and he'd say, guys, you know what, I should have. Now let me ask you a question. What did that allow everyone else in that room to do? The same thing. 
The same thing. All of a sudden, he created safety so people could, you know, geez, I wasn't playing as tough a defense as I should have in that first quarter, or whatever it is. What differentiated that team is that they were a highly aggressive learning organization. And that's the influence that you have on your, all the people you influence. We know from our research that high performers, top 10% performers extract, this is a great, great stat, they extract, literally extract three to five times more information from the same opportunity to learn as an average performer. Think about that for a minute. Even today, are you sitting on the edge of your seat saying, hey, I'm gonna take notes, I'm gonna try and get everything I can, or are you kinda of like, oh, I've heard stuff like this before and I'm kinda of tired, I'll look at my handheld. Literally, th that attitude will drive, are you a top 10% performer or not? So number one, you model the way when you're not afraid to admit a mistake. You create safety so other people, we're not about perfection in this organization, we're about learning. By the way, it makes sense given the world we live in, right, of education, number one. But number two, it increases something called source credibility. The minute you admit a mistake, the very next thing you say jumps up in source credibility. Why? Because people think, well, gosh, if Mark's not afraid to make a mistake here, I can take whatever he says next to the bank. And you increase how people look at you. You increase your reputation. So think about that. So many of us are kind of insecure. We're afraid to admit a mistake. We're afraid to you know, use those three most important words of leadership in my mind. I don't know. With so much change going on, technology change, legislative change, it's okay to say I don't know because here's the thing, when you say you don't know, you A, give permission to others to say I don't know, and if you don't know, don't try and pull the wool over people's eyes, but number two, you actually give an opportunity for other people to step in and grow their leadership capability. But here's what I wanna ask you right here and right now. What do you do when you're under pressure? When you're facing great change or difficult people? And then what's the impact of what you do in those moments on the important people, on the mission, on making a difference. I want to show you a video in a second, and what I want you to ask yourself is, when you face a pressure moment, a difficult moment, do you get paralyzed and avoid? Or in spite of that anxiety that you feel from that pressure moment, do you move forward? Now here's the point. In this moment, am I at my best to make a good decision? No, I'm not. When I'm down markers, chances are I will be primed by certain information, not all of information. We jump to conclusions based on, I said this earlier, less than 5% of available information when we've dropped markers, and that's when we're at risk to have impact we don't intend. And if nothing else, here's what I want you to think about. Know yourself so you're like, okay, I'm down a few markers, I'm gonna choose not to make that decision right here, right now. In fact, we know that the, the half-life of cortisol, which is the mediating chemical in our brain that makes all this happen, is about 18 minutes. Why do I say that? I say that because know that when you're dropping markers, and I drop markers all the time, I know, okay, for the next 18 minutes, I'm not gonna make a really big decision. And because he's connected to her, she will tell him what's really going on. I gotta tell you, we have three kids, 17, 15, 11. Staying connected so they actually will tell you, that's life or death stuff sometimes. Like, they don't get into a car because they're not afraid to call you, if you know what I mean, because someone's drinking. That's how, that's how important I think this is, to get to their side, to give them voice, not jump to conclusions and judge, to make them feel valued. Remember this, people don't do things to us. They do things for their own reasons, and we can get caught in the crossfire if we're not managing our brain in that moment. If we confuse impact for intent, if we're dropping markers, we don't know we've dropped markers and we're starting to ass assign blame and contribution. So just to know, hey, I'm feeling my three characteristics. Oh, I'm really certain I'm hot and I'm gonna act. Okay, JP, you're probably not processing this as well as you could. What more information do you need? And that's what I wanna challenge you around. We jump to judgment based on less than 5% of available information. We confuse impact for intent. Watch out for that. This will serve you. This, this will save you.